Hi there, and welcome to this video on A-level biology for the AQA specification, focusing on the topic of immunity, and in particular, on antibodies. I'm Manisha from StudyMind, where we help you to revise A-level biology with our helpful video tutorials tailored to your subject, your specification, and to you. If you're new here, please make sure to click that subscribe button. And whilst you're watching, feel free to leave any comments down below of anything you're unsure about, and let us know if it's your first time watching so we can send you our free revision resources. We also have helpful timestamps to guide you through the specification. So, let's get started. Welcome to lesson four of six in this tutorial, covering antibodies. This is the fourth video in our series of six lessons on the topic of immunity. In the last lesson, we were looking at the adaptive immune response and humoral immunity. Here are the key learning objectives for today's lesson. First, we'll be looking at the structure of antibodies, then at their functions. We'll also discuss monoclonal antibodies and finally look at ELISA testing. Here are the AQA specification points for today's lesson. Feel free to pause the video now and have a quick read through them before we begin. We'll start by looking at the definition of an antibody and its structure. We'll now look more closely at how antibodies work. Like all proteins, the structure of an antibody determines its function and specificity. Antibodies are glycoproteins. They are designed to recognise a specific antigen, and they have a specific shape which is complementary to that specific antigen. Antibodies are Y-shaped, and they are formed of four polypeptide chains. There are two long heavy chains, and two long light chains. Every antibody has the same constant region, which is used to bind during phagocytosis. Their variable region has a unique structure which is different for each and every antibody mo molecule. It is the antigen bonding site of the antibody by which the antibody can recognise and bind to a particular antigen. Antibodies also have hinge regions, which allow the Y branches to move away from each other. This makes the antibodies more flexible, so they can bind to multiple antigens. Pause the video now and see if you can name all the parts of an antibody. Antibody variable regions are complementary to specific antigens, and they form antigen-antibody complexes. This is similar to how enzyme active sites are complementary to specific substrates, forming enzyme-substrate complexes. Now let's look at toxin neutralisation. Many pathogens produce endotoxins, which harm the host organism. The antibodies can bind to these endotoxins and neutralise them. Additionally, antibodies can directly neutralise viruses. Most viruses have an attachment protein that's necessary for binding to and infecting the host cells. If an antibody binds to these viral attachment proteins, the virus is unable to infect the host cells. Antibodies can also bind to multiple antigens and clump the pathogens together. This big group is unable to infect cells, and it also makes it easy for phagocytes to engulf multiple pathogens in one go. Antibodies can also mark out pathogens. Antibodies bound to a pathogen are beacons for immunological cells and attract phagocytes and lymphocytes to the area. Now let's look at the uses of monoclonal antibodies. There are two types of antibodies, monoclonal and polyclonal. They have a highly specific antigen binding site. 
which means that they only recognise and bind to a very unique and specific antigenic sequence. Now let's look at some functions of monoclonal antibodies. These can be used to neutralise various poisons in patients and also in the treatment of cancer. The specific monoclonal antibodies can neutralise the cancer cells and attract cytotoxic T cells. The anti-cancer drugs can be attached to the monoclonal antibodies. We can have cell signalling through the ligands binding to a receptor on the cancer cell surface. Antibodies can bind to the ligand or to the receptor to prevent this signalling. We can also use monoclonal antibodies for medical diagnosis to detect particular antigens in a patient's sample of blood or tissue. Pregnancy testing uses monoclonal antibodies to detect for human chorionic gonadotrophin, or HCG. If a woman is pregnant, HCG will be found in the urine, so we can do urine tests using monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies can also be used to detect the presence of particular antigens or antibodies in a patient blood sample, tissue, using the ELISA tests. This test can find certain cancer-specific antigens in the blood and tissue to diagnose cancer patients. If we want to perform direct ELISA, we only need one antibody, which is complementary to the antigen we're testing for. If we're testing for HIV, here is how we do it. This is the indirect ELISA test, which uses two antibodies. The primary antibody will be complementary to the antigen, and the secondary antibody will carry an enzyme. Let's go through the steps of HIV testing. First, the HIV antigen is placed on a well plate at the bottom of a beaker. Then, we take a test tube containing water and pour in the entire solution. The secondary antibodies are added, which have an enzyme attached that's capable of binding to the HIV antibodies. A substrate is then added. Any enzyme present will convert this substrate into a coloured product, leading to a colour change, which shows that the HIV antigen is present. This is a quick summary of the indirect ELISA test. Remember, the enzyme will only be present if the secondary antibody is present. The secondary antibody will be washed away unless it's been bound to a primary antibody, which in turn is bound to the antigen. You might find it useful to research further methods for pregnancy testing online or in other books. The specification simply mentions medical diagnosis, so it's unlikely that you need to know the step-by-step -step method for pregnancy testing for HCG. In contrast, the specification does mention ELISA tests, so make sure you know this well. Polyclonal antibodies have diverse antigen binding sites. They can only recognise a particular antigen, but can recognise different variations of it, such as the same antigen in a different species, or mutant versions of the antigen. There are two types of immunity, natural and artificial. Natural immunity comes from the body's response to an antigen. The first time an organism is infected, the body mounts a primary immune response. This creates immunological memory for the second of the infection. The memory cells that are developed will be useful. The memory B cells can launch a more rapid immune response to eliminate the pathogen. Artificial immunity results from the priming of the immune system through the use of vaccines. We have only developed vaccines against viruses at the moment. 
Vaccines are dead or weakened viruses which can be injected into an individual. These will contain the necessary antigens to develop immunological memory against the pathogen. When an individual encounters the live virus, the body has an efficient mechanism in place to rapidly detect and eliminate it. We've now covered the learning objectives for today's lesson. If there's anything you feel unsure about, feel free to skip back through the video and re-watch it. We've now completed Lesson 4. If you enjoyed this tutorial, make sure to subscribe by clicking down below and leaving a comment of the topic that you'd like to see a video on. Click here to watch the rest of our videos in our A-Level Biology series, or visit our website, studymind.co.uk, for past paper compilations by topic and specification.